Oh, damn. Okay, so the Apple event for October is just wrapped up and I just had to get my red desk mat out because this event was fire. Hello everyone, this is Mike from Tech Car Moon. And if you enjoy Apple tech and Apple related tech, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and notification bell so you get notified. So this event was incredible like truly truly incredible i honestly had so many doubts because there were so many rumors around this that it just seemed too good to be true and it seemed like they were going to be adding everything we've ever wanted and Knowing Apple, they typically don't give us everything we've ever wanted. There's always something that they leave on the table to just disappoint us. But this time, it doesn't look to be the case. They've introduced two models, a 14-inch and a 16-inch, and both of them, in my opinion, look gorgeous. So they've gone back to a more of a rounded design, similar to the old 15-inch MacBook Pros and the old 2015 MacBook Pros. So let's start with the displays, because there are a lot of changes with this display, and it is in my opinion one of the best displays on the market currently i don't think there's anything out there that will beat it so yes it has a notch but seriously who cares firstly housed in the notch is a 1080p camera finally and it has a bigger sensor for better low light performance also with this notch it's not going to interfere with your user interface because by the looks of it it's going to sit in line with the status bar on the top and then when you're in full screen mode it's actually going to move that full screen section down to the bottom of the notch and then block out the notch section. So it's not gonna interfere with any of your full screen apps, but what it does make me think is, what's the point in having full screen apps? Because if it's not gonna take advantage of that top end part, then you might as well just have everything maximized and then have the ability to see the status bar with all the little menus on the top. Now, because of the new screen, we're seeing 23% uh, thinner bezels around the sides, and then on the top, we're seeing 60% less border, which in my opinion, I'm glad to see. Now, the biggest thing about this screen is basically everything right it's got a 120 hertz display which is adaptive so very similar to the promotion display on the ipad pros you are going to see the same technology here with the new macbooks and also you can set them to fixed frame rates if you really choose to so let's say there's something critical that needs to have a fixed frame rate then you can set that manually in the settings this also has mini led so you will have a thousand sustained nit brightness and and 1,600 peak brightness. This also can display up to a billion colors, which means to me or suggests to me that this is actually a true 10-bit display rather than maybe an upscaled 8-bit uh, display like on the previous models. So we should see more colors, better reproduction of colors, and we should see a much better contrast ratio as well, thanks to mini LED. Now you may be wondering, will this display have blooming because it's a mini LED display? Well, yes, it probably will because I mean, it's mini LED. It's just the nature of the technology. Plus, Apple didn't mention how many local dimming zones there are or how many mini LEDs there are in the display. I couldn't find anything. Let me know down in the comments below if you have found it. Obviously, I'm trying to do this video very quickly, but yeah, it didn't. I couldn't see any specs about it, but it just looks to me like they're focusing on obviously the quality of the display and obviously focusing on that 120 hertz. Now, this is the exact same screen as what you'll find in the new 16 inch as well. So everything that I'm going to be mentioning will be applicable to the 16 inch model as well, because there's really no differences between the two. But I will highlight the differences when I get to that. Now, moving down to the keyboard, they have got rid of the touch bar. And for probably 80% of us, we are glad to see this go because for me, I did so many accidental touches with it. And there were a few scenarios like using the emoji keys and stuff like that, that was fantastic on that touch bar. But realistically, getting rid of it is probably better than keeping it and having to deal with those frustrating issues. Connectivity also got a huge upgrade. And for you guys who are holding on to your 2015 MacBook Pro because of the lack of connectivity options on the old MacBook Pro lineup, well, this is gonna be your saving grace because on one side of the MacBook Pros, both on the 14 and 16 inch, you're getting an HDMI port, a Thunderbolt 4 port, and an SD card slot on one side. And then on the other side, we're getting an 
uh, headphone jack and two Thunderbolt ports, as well as MagSafe. So yes, MagSafe makes a return and they come in two different power outputs depending on which model you go for. So on the 14 inch, I believe it's up to 91 watts configurable. And then on the 16 inch, it's 140 watts. And just to let you know as well, using the MagSafe charger instead of using the uh, USB-C port for charging, which is still, you are still able to do, um, you will get a 50% charge with only 30 minutes. So that is a big boost. 30 minutes of charge time for 50% battery power is phenomenal. And speaking of battery life and charging, just to let you know, the 14 inch offers 17 hours of video playback and the 16 inch offers 21 hours of video playback, which is, just amazing to see. And it's actually the the most amount of battery charge that they've offered in a Mac. Now let's talk about the chips in these things because oh, there is a lot to break down. So firstly, in both models, you can configure them exactly the same. Now, the weird thing is, is that if you actually configure them a little bit higher than their base models, right? The 16 inch MacBook Pro is actually only a hundred pound difference uh, compared to the 14 inch. So for that extra hundred pounds, if size really isn't a thing for you, then getting obviously better speakers, better battery life and that bigger screen, I mean, for me, it's probably worth that extra hundred, but I'm getting both in just to let you know, so we'll have to see it in person. But anyway, the chips. You got the M1 Pro and the M1 Max, and there's some really significant differences between the two that could be a deal breaker in choosing one over the other. So let's go through some of the basics between the two. So the M1 Pro has 200 gigabytes of memory bandwidth per second, and the M1 Max has 400 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth. And also on the M1 Pro, it's only configurable up to 32 gigabytes of unified memory, whereas on the M1 Max, you can configure that all the way up to 64 gigabytes of unified memory. Now, both have the same CPU cores. Now, obviously, depending on the configuration, is up to 10 core of uh, eight high performance cores and two efficiency cores. Now, on the 14 inch model, there you do see an eight core variant, which is six high performance cores and two efficiency cores, which is very interesting. So this is a binned M1 Pro. So what that means is, is that basically the M1 Pro chips, if they don't quite meet the standard uh, to reach the full 10 cores on the CPU, then, you know, because sometimes one or two cores may, may fail, what they do is, is they just disable those and then offer a cheaper option. Now, the GPU side is really, really interesting. So on the M1 Pro, it is configurable up to a 16 core GPU, whereas on the M1 Max, this is configurable up to a 32 core GPU. So Apple showed us a few graphs of the performance of of the GPU and CPU. Now, I really wanna dive into the GPU side of things, right? Because I think a lot of us really are more concerned with GPU than CPU. And especially if you are looking between the M1 Pro and the M1 Max, apart from a couple of other situations, realistically, the only reason why you would go for the M1 Max is because you want more GPU performance, because the CPU performance is identical between the two. Now, if you go for the highest configurable M1 Pro, they actually compared it to a Lenovo Legion 5 15 inch, which has a 3050 Ti graphics card. So looking at the graph, it looks like the 16 core GPU in the M1 Pro is on par to a 3050 Ti in a laptop, which isn't bad. It's not fantastic, don't get me wrong, but within this type of architecture, it's definitely going to make a huge difference. And as more programs take advantage of it, I think it's probably going to age better than let's say a Windows laptop with a 3050 Ti in it. And for those who don't know, a 3050 Ti is kind of Nvidia's kind of entry level uh, discrete graphics card. So it's pretty powerful, but it's nothing on the high end, that's for sure. But it will definitely blow the M1 chip out of the water. It's meant to actually deliver twice the amount of graphical performance compared to the M1. Now let's talk about the M1 Max because a lot of you are probably considering this option and you're probably wondering what else do I get with it? The M1 Max actually comes with two video encoder engines as well as two ProRes encode and decode engines. So this is double the amount of the M1 Pro and obviously much better than the M1 chip itself. Now, there were some very interesting things that 
I sort of dissected looking at the performance graphs that Apple showed us. So they compared it to a Compact Pro laptop and then a high-end laptop with a discrete graphics card. And I really wanted to find out what they were. So they actually compared it to an MSI GE776 uh, Raider and a Razer Blade 15 Advanced Edition. And both of those have 3080 GPUs. Now, it looks like the 30 core GPU in the M1 Max is between 5 to 6% slower than a dedicated 3080 GPU, but is actually consuming 100 watts less power than those uh, computers. Now, this is assuming that the 3080 on the graph is 400 and the M1 Max 32 core GPU is around 375 to 380 just by eyeballing it. So, yeah, a 5 to 6.25% difference um, in the real world, especially with the optimizations that obviously Macs have. I think that potentially in the real world, it, you might not even notice a difference or potentially you might actually see this 32 core GPU outperforming a laptop class 3080 GPU in a, a laptop. Now again, not to brag, but I do actually have a 3080 GPU as well as an AMD 5900X uh, CPU. So, and that is a 16 core CPU. So if you would like to see me do a showdown of basically almost what AMD has the best has to offer on their CPU, as well as Nvidia's almost best what they have to offer on their GPU. And this looks like the GPU that they're that Apple are trying to compare it against. Would you like me to build a PC with these components in it and hit it against it? Let me know in the comments anyway. Oh, uh, oh God, I can't believe I just did that. This thing is like <laughs> gold dust at the moment. Uh, yeah, leave a comment down below if you want me to do that test. Now let's get into the mics and the speakers because they have also got a huge upgrade as well. So the mics are obviously better with a 60% lower noise floor than the previous models. And you now have a six speaker system. So they have four uh, noise cancelling woofers that can actually reveal up to half an octave deeper and it has more bass as well. So actually 80% more bass. And in terms of the tweeters as well, you should see much clearer and fuller vocals according to Apple. And finally, we get spatial audio on a MacBook. And this is both on the 14 inch and on the 16 inch. So. Yeah, pretty cool. And lastly, when it comes to specs, the storage has also got a major upgrade. So firstly, it, we're seeing double the amount of speeds compared to previous MacBooks, as well as even the M1, right? So we're getting 7.4 gigabytes per second read speeds. Now I couldn't see anything regarding the write speeds, but if it's, my guess would probably be like 6.4 to maybe 6.6 .6 gigabytes per second uh, re write speeds, which is very, very impressive. Now, in terms of pricing, the 14 inch will be $1,999 and the 16 inch will be $2,499. So pretty good, right? It's, it's only about $100 to $200 extra compared to last year's model. But I think with the amount of features this thing packs, I really don't think that that price increase uh, should really be moaned at, right? You know, you're getting 120 hertz display, mini LED, uh, much better brightness. You're getting obviously more ports, better battery, better CPU, better GPU, even with the base configurations, right? Even without having to spec this thing out, I think that you're getting such good value for money that I think that for the price, comparing it to other laptops in the market, especially for how thin this thing is, right? Not, I'm not saying compare it to like these proper gaming PCs, 17 inch with, you know, it's thick fans and stuff like that. I mean, you really can't compare the two, right? I think that for value for money, I think that these MacBooks have only got better. And uh, I think that these MacBooks, even on the high end, comparing it to other high end laptops from, from the, the Windows side of things or the PC Mastery side of things, I think that these MacBooks, will definitely uh, be able to hold its own, if not kind of knock them out of the park. The, this type of performance is available both plugged in and unplugged. When you, as soon as you start comparing these laptops unplugged, 
there's just there's just no competition. These MacBooks will blow those out of the water. There, there's no point in if even testing them, right? Because they, firstly, those laptops they consume so much power, and yeah, the MacBooks, even though yeah they can consume a lot of power on the high end, they don't consume anywhere near the same amount of power compared to those laptops. But anyway, I'll leave the specs of the laptops that I've uh, bought anyway, so that you guys can see what I'm checking out. And yeah, as soon as I get them in, obviously I'll be comparing them. I've got the M1 MacBook as well, so I'll be comparing it against that to see if there's actually any real difference if you're getting uh, more value for money compared to, let's say, the base model M1 MacBook Air, you know, because I know that a lot of you have been sort of holding off on that or or maybe like thinking, oh, should I be upgrading it or, or whatever? I'll definitely let you know what my recommendations are. So make sure to hit that subscribe button and like button if you want to, you know, check that stuff out. But if you want to see more videos from me right now, you guys know what to do. Click on one of those two videos. You'll absolutely enjoy it. Anyway, this has been a long video. Look after yourselves and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.